Good morning, True Life Church. How are you guys doing? Good. Awesome. Uh, this morning, before we even get started the sermon, I just wanted to paint a little picture for you guys. Uh, you guys all know what this is? A ball, all right? It's a, it's a specific ball. It's a volleyball. Can I have a Natasha? Can you come over here, Natasha? So I used to be a... Um, I used to be a student of this thing, and I eventually became a competitive player of this thing, and then I eventually became a coach. And so part of it is, if, if you're going to handle this thing, it's not just, you know, you just don't juggle it around, but it's actually a, you got to learn how to, what we call bump, set, and spike, okay? So what, how to bump a ball, and Natasha's going to show us how to bump it, okay? You ready, Natasha? We did not practice this, all right? So give her some grace, all right? You ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, that's a bump, all right? So it, it bounced off her arms, all right? And Natasha's going to set the ball first. You ready? All right, here you go. There we go, all right. So she had to use her hands in there, okay? And right, now Natasha's going to spike the ball at me, all right? Softly, okay? You guys see her guns, all right? Do not kill me, okay? You ready? So I'll try to, okay, ready? Go. Okay, all right, let's give a round of applause for Natasha. All right. So to some of you guys, this is foreign. Right? Some of you guys would rather take this and kick it across the field. Uh, and to some of you guys, you'd rather take this and throw it at somebody, right? Dodgeball. And for some of you, you'd rather have this minimized and throw it in a glove. Uh, and for others of you, you would kick this into a, a, a goal, right? Um, but this is a volleyball. To some of you guys, it may seem foreign, uh, very much like the message today. Some of you may be very fam familiar with what this is, very much like Natasha, who's, who's been a, a student of the game, and now she's a competitive player of the game. And one day she will become a coach of the game. But I pray that the Word of God today will be very much like this, that it won't just be foreign, but you'll be able to grasp it. You'll be able to use it, and you'll be able to live it out. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for each and every one of the folks that made it out here this morning. Lord, even though it's Labor Day, I pray, as Pastor James said, that they would find rest in you, that they would find rest in your word, and your word would be uh, like a light, like a pathway, as we sing this morning, unto their feet, unto their heart, and to their mind. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would illuminate the way for us today. I pray that your word will become more alive this afternoon than it was this morning or than it was yesterday, Lord. Thank you for who you are. I pray that the Holy Spirit will fill this room so that, uh, Lord, everyone in here will... Um, overspill to those once they leave this room, those that are around them, Lord. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Whoa. So uh, there's, there's a story of a pastor. Um, the pastor was once at a revival, and a revival is... Uh, it was at a church once, and what happened at the, the revival was the pastor was there, and he was the main speaker. And as he was speaking, uh, the Holy Spirit just made himself known, meaning people started speaking in tongues, and there was miracles happening. People were praying, and people were being healed, and people were uh, coming to know Christ for the first time. And all in the midst of this, the pastor was actually late for his flight because he was the guest speaker. And so as he was speaking at this uh, church, at this revival, uh, many people were coming to Christ and all these crazy things were happening. And so from the moment that he was speaking to the next, he found himself dragged off the stage. Pastor, you need to leave. You need to catch your flight in order to get back home. And so he found himself from the pulpit all the way to the airport. And while he was at the airport, he was in line, okay? And he, he's still feeling the Holy Spirit. He's still feeling, the, I, I guess, the residue. He's still feeling the power. He's still feeling uh, the glory. He's still feeling the majesty of what had happened at that church. And he's sitting in line. He's got his hands in his pocket, and, you know, he's, 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 he's this big guy. He's just kind of waving back and forth, you know, I don't know what people do when they wait at airport lines. Uh, but he's just sitting there, and he's waiting. And then he notices this little old lady who's behind him. And the little old lady moves a little bit closer to him. And he's like, okay, it's kind of weird, but I'm just going to keep praising God in my heart. 
and in my mind. And then he notices that the lady gets closer and closer. So he's thinking, man, I probably smell. We were jumping, we were dancing, we were singing. And he sniffs his armpit, he sniffs his other one. He's like, nope. And he's like, well, I don't know. He's just closing his eyes and he's just enjoying his time in God's presence. And the lady gets right up to his shoulder, like right about here. And she looks right up at him. He looks right at, down at her. And he says, uh, you like that? <laughs> and she looks at him and she's like, I do. What is that? He's like, that's the Holy Spirit. And right then and there, he started preaching to the lady. I don't know if she ever came to Christ, but he started teaching her about the gospel. And she's like, what is that? She's like, I've never felt that before. And then and there was a spirit-filled moment where he was so filled with the Holy Spirit that it was radiating, it was smelling, it was everything about him felt different to that lady. Uh, another, another, there's another time when I was on my way to, um, when I was up in New York, I used to take classes. Our, our main campus was in upstate New York, but I would take classes in New York City. And my buddies and I, we would drive in and then we would park our car and then we would take uh, the subway station into the city. And one time we decided to commute. And so my Korean buddy, um, Dennis and I, we we got into his car and we're about to cross the George Washington Bridge. It's, it's a big blue bridge in New York City. And as we got to the bridge, he said, hey, Steve, we're going to pick up this girl. And I was thinking like, are you crazy? We're going to pick up a random Asian girl, right? We're crossing from Fort Lee, which is Korean town, all the way into New York City, in Manhattan. And he's like, we're going to pick up this girl. And I'm like, no, we're not going to pick up a stranger. He's like, no, this is how we commute. If we, have two or, if we have two or more in the car, when we get to the bridge, we don't have to pay that much of a toll. And I'm like, we don't even know her. And he's like, let's pick her up. And I thought, like, pick her up. Like, for me, pick her up meant, like, let's, like, like, let, let, let me try to talk to her, date her, right? And I'm like, I'm a married man. You're a single guy. Like, this will look weird. Two guys picking up. He's like, don't worry. I was like, so we pulled up. And I guess in New York City, people walk along the road and they wait to be picked up, right? That's just the thing. She gets in the back of the car. She sits, sits in the back. I'm in the passenger seat. My buddy Dennis is in the driver and we're going across the bridge. And he starts to tell me his testimony. And I start sharing him of my, my testimony. And we, 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 all, we forget that this girl's in the car. And Dennis is like, yeah, man, I used to do this. I used to do this. And now I am saved for Jesus Christ. And I was like, yeah, dude, me too. I used to be like this. I used to be like this. And now I live for Christ. And we're like exchanging testimonies. And we get across the bridge. We take, we take the girl to her stop. And then she opens her door. And she wa- right before she walks out, she gets out of the car and she's like, she's like, great testimonies, guys. God bless you. She slams the doors and walks away. And we're like, she was eavesdropping the whole time, right? And we're like, but we thought back about it. We're like, dude, we just ministered to her without ministering to her. We, like the overflow of God's goodness in our lives. We didn't even think that we were to minister to her or to say anything to her. Because it's just another Asian girl that my friend Dennis decided to pick up on our way into class. But I bet that she heard the stories that she felt the power of God through our conversation. Let me ask you guys this morning, what does it mean to live that kind of life? To be so filled or to be so close to God that other people want what you have. Other people, they, they want to, like, give me some of that. You ever see somebody eat an ice cream and like they make it look so good, right? Every time I see my kids eat ice cream or popsicles, I'm like, hey, hey, let me have a bite. They're like, no, dad, you're going to eat the whole thing, right? Because I do. I'm like, it looks so good. But what does it look like for you and I in the basics of Christianity to have that, to be filled and to, for others to want that? Very much like that volleyball analogy. You have to learn how to bump and set and spike and block before you can even enter into the game. I see people get into the game and they just stand there and then the ball comes, boom, right? So if, today is the basic necessities to your Christian walk. And it's all about this abundant life, this kingdom life. That is how you can achieve that. I don't know if that's what you want this morning, but I pray that that is what the Lord will put on your heart. Uh, just a very quick verse. I don't have this up here, but in Second Corinthians uh, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 17, 
Um, Jesus talks about this. I mean, Paul talks about this and says, Therefore, if anyone's in, anyone is in Christ, they're, the new crea- they're a new creation. The old things have passed away and the new things have come. And this is what actually Jesus is talking about. He's talking about this abundant life in John chapter 10, verse 10. If you guys can pull that up. This is what he's saying. He says that the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is Jesus speaking. And the NIV, it says the thief comes to only, only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have life to the fullest. Okay? Or have life to full. To the full. Let me tell you guys this. When Jesus is explaining this, He's talking about this is what it looks like. This is this is who the devil is. And he says, but wait, this is who I am. Listen, men, they can promise us men, can promise us things, tangible things. They can promise us money, fame, wealth. But never has another man in our history promised to give you life eternal. Only Jesus Christ can do that. But it's hard to understand. It's hard to obtain this abundant life, this kingdom life. Because we're born into a sinful world, right? Very basic. So what Jesus is saying here is we have this enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Can you guys say that to your neighbor? We have an enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Just say that to your neighbor. Yeah, we have an enemy who steals, kills, and destroys. Get that right, okay? And what does it mean that this enemy has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy? This explanation of still is he comes to still is I mean he comes to invade in your life. He comes to seize, to carry away your property. And this is what uh, Jesus is addressing at this time in this passage. Is he's addressing the teachers. He's addressing the false pe- uh, uh, preachers of his time. Because such teachers, they would come not in by the right door, right? Because Jesus is actually giving this analogy right before this of him being the shepherd and the sheep coming in by the gate. And that's the only proper way. But these false teachers, they will come in with their own agenda, not by divine appointment or commission, but they will seek to deceive and to carry away the sheep of Christ. It's you, his lamb, his sheep. So this enemy of ours, he wants to kill Any thoughts of joy, peace, patience, kindness that you and I have? He wants to destroy our image. He'll attack your identity. He wants to destroy your very life. Let me tell you, it's not just, he's not an enemy that comes in a ferocious red suit with a pitchfork and, hey, I'm here to kill, destroy you, right? Ah, And he pokes you, right? If Satan showed up like that, I would actually be more, opposed to defending myself than if he came in a cunning voice. And he said, look at that girl. Stare at her. Lust after her. And then that temptation comes and then you start to sin. Right? But if he showed up in a red suit with the pitchfork, I'm like, get away from me, Satan, in the name of Jesus. But he comes to us in our heart's desire. He says, it's okay. No one's going to know about that. No one's watching you. Go ahead, do that. Go ahead and look at that. Go ahead and eat that. Very cunning, very deceiving. So the, these terms of stealing, of destroying, right, of taking away, this, these are not attributes of God, but of God's enemy, Satan. He doesn't play fear, this enemy of ours. He will use your heart's desires. He will use your friends. He will use your family to tear you down. He will try try to destroy marriages. He will try to destroy families. He will try to destroy our church from the leadership down. John Maxwell, he says it like this, and this is for if you are a leader in here, you know that this rings true and it rings true for me. John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And you got to read the whole rest of the book to understand that he's actually talking about Jesus. He's talking about you and I as well as servants, servant leaders. 
And if Jesus didn't take the position that he did as a servant leader and lead us in the way he did, we, we wouldn't have an example to follow after. A professor once said to me, he said, the moment that you come to Christ, and you believe in him, and you accept in his word, and you receive the Holy Spirit, the moment of conversion, you get a red target, I mean, you get a target on your back with a red bullseye, and Satan is after you. I'm like, wow, that's that's very comforting. But you also, and you also take a label that says, I am against Satan. I will not follow the ways of this world, or will I follow the lies of the enemy. But, here's the but, you have to not, you, you don't have to worry because you have Jesus. Jesus, well, I used to always quote this verse and I would say, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I forget the second part that Jesus says, I came that they may have life, meaning you guys and me, and we may have it abundantly. Life to the fullest. Here, here's a description of this abundant life, right? The abundant life is eternal life. So if Yvonne talks about it all the time, he puts up that chart that we see. I'm not going to put it up today. A life that, this abundant life, it's a life that begins the moment that you and I, we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And it doesn't just end here, it goes all throughout eternity. So the biblical definition of life or eternal life is specifically given to us by Jesus in John chapter 17, verse 2 and 3. He says, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those have give, who have given to him. Verse 3, catch this. He says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom have sent, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that we may know the true God and we may know the true Christ who God has sent. That is what's being said here in John chapter 17. So say to your neighbor, do you know what the abundant life is. And then you can answer your neighbor, yes, I do. Because I have eternal life. Some of you guys are like, wait, do I, ha- do I really have it? I just say something that Pastor Steve made me say, right? Do I really have it? This abundant life is life, what Jesus is saying, I have not come to kill, steal, or destroy anything. I've come to give you life and life to the fullest. This abundant life is a life in fullness. Fullness in what? Fullness in Him, in Jesus Christ. The Arabic uh, translates it like this, that they may have life eternal, a life to come, which is in Christ. A life that is, that is here, yet not in its fullness. It's access here right now, but yet it's not here in its fullness. Now I think of this way, and I think of the word abundant, right? I think, ooh, God has promised me abundant life. I'm going to get a fancy car. I'm going I'm to have a nice family. I'm going to have a nice house. I'm going to get a, a white picket fence. I'm going to have land, and I'm going to lo- live lusciously, and I'm going to enjoy life, right? That's abundant life, right? No, that's this false prosperity life that we hear. Look, guys, uh, Rick Warren and their church, they say it like this, that co- some have come to see, some have come to do, and some have come to die. Which one are you? The Christian life is not about coming to just enjoy in the things that God blesses us because he wants to bless you and I with many things. But we don't just come to enjoy in his presence and the things and the giftings that he gives us. But we really, we've come to die because Jesus Christ said, those who want to gain their life, they must lose it in order to gain it, to have life. Jesus twists things, right? And it doesn't really twist things, but he speaks in parables, he speaks in ways in which man cannot understand until you truly understand what this abundant life is, what this eternal life is. So in terms of your... Uh, economic, academics, and your social status. Most Christians, right, we're, we don't, we're not privileged. We don't come from a privileged class. Most Christians are probably barely middle class to lower class. Few Christians are in the upper class. So it's not about the materialistic things of this world. The abundance life is not, get this right, 
about having a better car, about making six figures a year, or, or having the perfect family. I look at it this way. This abundant life, it's like an engagement. Some look at engagement, right? Some, how many guys are engaged in here? Uh, I mean, how many girls? Sorry, not guys. Guys. It, it never really is for the guy, right? And the guy just gives the ring away. He just waits to be married, okay? Um, and how many of you are married in here? Right? You notice how excited the engagements were, right? And then the, the married ones are just like, I admit it, I'm married. I'm just joking, guys. <laughs> you should be happy that you're happily, that you're happily married. But I look, if you guys can remember back, some of you guys were engaged, like Hmong engaged, and then you waited like six months and you got married, officially married. Some of you guys were engaged where you gave a ring and you were engaged for maybe three months, six months, eight months, and then you got married, right? And then some of you guys were like engaged and married on the same day, right? You were forced to. I love this man. I take this man. I love this woman. I take this woman. All right, let's do this thing, right? There's no engagement, period. But this abundant life, this kingdom life, this eternal life, it's like I said, it's here, but yet not in its fullness. And this is what it looks like. It's an engagement. But some of us in here, we look at it, we, we kind of play it. I mean, we kind of look at it in, in our own engagement. This engagement is so long. I can't wait to be with her. Right? And some of you, while you're engaged in this season, you're like, this is so beautiful. This is what Christ was talking about. I can't wait till my wedding day, but I have every day up to my wedding day to enjoy my time with my fiance and to build life, to join my, our bank accounts, to start planning our future together. I want to have 30 kids. No, I only want to have 10 kids. And then you get, if you guys have, I married eight couples last year, right? What a crazy summer for me. This, this summer, I didn't marry any couples, which was nice. Um, not that it was bad last summer, but then you get to start this thing, what I call premarital counseling. And you get to come in and, and I get to drill you with questions and I get to walk you through life, right? That's what happens in the engagement period. That's what I see this abundant life. Because even in the engagement period, you still enjoy in a lot of the things uh, of the uh, benefits of marriage. You just don't enjoy in marriage itself yet. Do we understand that? Some of you single people are like, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. <laughs> I probably will never get there. But it's like dating. And then when you go to another step, you get engaged. And then you go to a deeper step, you get married. And when you get married, you have kids. And then your kids go and repeat that cycle. But this abundant life, it is a process. It is a cycle of life that you and I get to walk in. So let me ask you guys this. How do I know that I share in this abundant life? Okay, Ask your neighbor that. How do you know that you share in this abundant life? Here's a few ways that I, you can help your neighbor and I can help you, okay? Very much like that bump, set, and spike. We're going to walk through these uh, steps together. This is one way in viewing or in knowing that you have this abundant life, right? When, when we've noticed that people have changed by the power of Christ, that their lives are different, which affects all aspects of their experience of life. That's how you know when someone or when you start to notice in other people that they are different or when they notice in you that you are different, others will start to notice. That's how you know you're living an abundant life. We call that a spirit-filled life. Amen? All right, let's turn to our, uh, our passage today, and it's going to help us really understand this in Acts chapter 3, uh, starting from verse 1. It says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And then in verse 2, he says, Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put, to every, uh, put there every day to beg from those who were going up to the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Verse 4, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, 
And then instantly the man, uh, the man's feet and ankles began uh, became strong. Verse eight. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. One way of of viewing the abundant life is to see when people have changed by the power of Christ. They live different lives. This affects all aspects of their experience of life. From sinner to saint, from slave into son and daughtership. I want you guys to do something real quick. Just look around you. Just look, look at the people around you. Nobody ever came to church perfect. Nobody ever walked into this building and was a super Christian, was super theological, and was straight up who they are today, right? Everybody came in here broken. Everybody walked in here having very little knowledge of Scripture. Some of y'all, even if you grew up in the church and your, your family were, uh, your dad and your mom were pastors, or you grew up in the church and your mom and dad served in the church, they may have fed you the word of God growing up, but you still grew up in a broken world. And at one point in your life, and it isn't your mother or your father's faith, but it had to be your own faith. You had to make a conscious decision and a heartfelt understanding of the gospel and you had to come to a realization that this is Jesus who died for me. I screwed up. I didn't deserve this. And he died for me. That is part of the abundant life. Some of us in here, we used to be fishermen, as I talked about last week. We used to just fish, but now we are fisher of men. We're living for Christ. Some of us in here, very much like that volleyball, ball used to be life. Right, But I count it all as lost, all surpassing when I look at the life of Christ, when I'm living after Christ. Some of us in here, we used to consider things as sex, drugs, and money. Like That was life. If I could obtain those things, if I could grasp those things, if I could feel those good things every day in my life, then oh, that is, that is life, living life to the fullest. These young people, I'm, I'm a couple years behind, they use this acronym, Y-O-L-O, right? YOLO. You only live once. But Christ says, look, if you lose your life, for my sake, you will gain your life. You don't need all those things. Look around, right? As I said, there's so many people in this room who struggle through those things, who, who Christ is still, even in the season, bringing them through it. Here's the truth. If no one's ever told you and how you were transformed and how you're living this abundant life, it's because you had an encounter with the living God. Some of you, it may have been in your car. It may have been in your room. It may have been in your bathroom. It may have been in a, in a very intimate place. For others of you, it may be when you went on mission. It may be right here in this church, right here on these steps when you came and nailed forward. It may be right here in the fellowship hall. It may have been at some other church when they called you up and to give your life to Christ. And then for some of you, it may be in the midst of a broken marriage. It may be in the midst of you wanting to take your own life that the Holy Spirit encountered you. And for some of us, it may be in the midst of all of our troubles while you're at school, while you're at work, and you just want to give up. But the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father, the Trinity, they encounter you, so you encounter the living God, and they speak life into you. I like to just share this with you and just make a fool of myself, but I can remember the first time I, uh, I went to Bible college. Like when I left at the age of uh, 20 to go to Bible college, my mom, like literally I was in my Toyota Corolla, right? And I was driving away and my mom stuck her hand in the window, held on to the steering wheel and said, you cannot go. I'm like, mom, the car's packed. I'm leaving. She's like, no, you cannot go. 
because you're not. Like, you just cannot. You're like, you're not. She pretty much said, you're not smart enough. You won't make it. She's trying to use reverse psychology on me. And I'm like, got my foot on the, the brake pedal. I'm like, mom, I'm going no matter what you say. My mom's like, okay. She took her hand off the wheel, right? And I'm like, mom, I'll see you at Thanksgiving. Actually, I'll see you at Christmas. And I drive off into the sunset. No, I mean, I drive off. <laughs> and, I, and I head towards Bible college. And I actually didn't come home. I actually didn't go back to my parents' house during Christmas. I didn't come home until that summer. And that's the summer that Nasifu and I got engaged. But I came home back that summer. And you know, I, I never expected this. I, I, I got back home. I, I lost some weight too. And I've gained plenty of weight since then. Uh, don't laugh. That hurts. I'm just joking. <laughs> But I got home and my, my mom goes, there's something different about you. And she said, of course, she said it in Hmong. And I, and I, was, I was like, what's different? I was like, you know, trying to check myself. And I'm like, is there something in my hair? And my mom's like, you're more at peace. You're more loving towards your dad and I. And I was like, because you guys haven't yelled at me yet. I'm thinking in the back of my head. And I'm still doubting myself, but she's like, there's something different about it. My sisters, they come over, they invite me over, and I go eat pho at their place, and they take me out to eat because I have been gone all year. And they're like, there's something different about you. And my siblings, they're, they're, all, they're all saying the same thing in different ways. There's something different. Well, little did I know that I had really attained this abundant life, that part of it was that God was already working in and through me. So how do you know that you have abundant life? This is when other people start to notice it. I pray that that will be you today when you walk out these doors. Here's the second th- thing. You got to learn how to bump and then you got to learn how to set before you got to learn how to spike. So part of the second thing is when people start to notice things about you, then you start to speak out. You start to live out things that Jesus has commissioned, the things that Jesus that tells you to live out. Peter and John, that passage that I read, they received Christ. They live with Christ. And so then in return, what did they do? They started to speak the gospel. They spoke healing. They prayed for people. And that lame man was healed. And, and then what happens after that, and if you, if you look here in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, what's happening here is this is a result of the kingdom life, of the life eternal, of this abundant life. Because the abundant life, as I said before, it's not about materialistic things, but it's about Christ and God, and the Holy Spirit moving in and through you. So the second thing here is, if, if you have this abundant life, you would begin to speak and do things the way that Jesus did. And look here. In Acts chapter 4, um, uh, verse 3, it says, They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. Because they were proclaiming this and because they healed this man through the power of Christ. But many who heard the message believed so that the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Because they healed the man. And everybody heard about it. I don't even think these 5,000 saw it, but they heard it. So the gospel has to start with you and I hearing it and receiving it and hear. 5,000 came to believe that day. When the Holy Spirit fills you, you can't help but to proclaim Jesus. Let's fast forward right here to Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders and people, if we are being examined today about a a kind of service to a man who was lame to determine how he was healed, then let this be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. This is the Christ. This is Peter speaking about Christ. Verse 12, salvation exists in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. This is the gospel message. Verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They marveled and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Peter and John. Not that they just knew Jesus, not that they they read about Jesus, but they 
themselves or with the living God. And that is why they're operating. That's why they're moving in the power of Jesus Christ through the name of Jesus Christ. So this is what Peter is doing. He's, he explains it like this. You're trying to find a reason for the work of God. Like this man was healed by the work of God. And you're trying to explain it by worldly terms, by worldly measures, but it can't be. It's Jesus Christ himself. Because there's no other name under what ha- heaven and on earth that salvation can come to man, only through Jesus Christ. That's what Peter is saying here. And so by the power of, jo- uh, of God, Peter and John were able to pray and heal this man. Right? And actually, they didn't even really pray. They just had a couple words. Right? Get up and walk, right? And get up. And all of a sudden, by the faith of the man, his ankles started to uh, get strength in him, and he was able to stand. The lame beggar is healed. Then they're arrested. They're arrested for doing God's work. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches the gospel. How many of you guys, if you get, if the, if we're in a, if we were in a third world country, or I mean, not third world country, if we're in a, uh, a country where we could not, where we wouldn't have freedom of speech or freedom of religion, if the cops walked in right now, right, if we were in that country and they said, every one of you, we're going to drag you to jail just for listening to the word of God, right? How many of you guys would freely go? And then while you're in jail, you would just preach, right? Hypothetically, how many of you would go, right? Some of us in here are like, uh, I want to avoid that question. I want to look down, no eye contact, right? I don't have to, I don't want to answer that question. This is part of this eternal life. This is part of this abundant life that you and I, we will face these things in proclaiming the word of God. Here's this, the simple simplicity of the gospel. You have to hear it. And once you hear it, it's so good, you can't help but to proclaim it. You understand it? When you, once you hear it and you receive it, you can't help because it's so good but to proclaim it. That's the abundant life. That's being filled. That's called the spirit-filled life. I want you guys to repeat this with me. It's about being filled. So saying, it's about being filled. Then giving it out. All right. It's about being filled. And then giving it out. Let's say it again. It's about being filled. Then giving it out. Giving out in that of Christ, right? The abundant life. But then again, let's go back to John 10.10. 10. We got to remember this verse that we have an enemy who comes to kill, I mean to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Right? What does he come to steal, to kill, and to destroy? He comes to do that of what you have heard and what you are proclaiming. Verse 12 says, salvation exists in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. But verse 13 says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, the boldness meaning Peter and John, they, even though they were arrested, they were still preaching, proclaiming Jesus Christ. They knew that they had, they marveled at them because they knew, they knew that they were ordinary, unschooled, and know, they know that they had been with Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Do the people around you know that you have been with Jesus? Do the people around you know that you have this abundant life? Do the people around you care enough to ask you, or do they notice something different about you? Have you been with Jesus lately? Yeah, we just did communion. We had a little Jesus time. We had our forgiveness there. Have you really been with Jesus lately? If you have, not only will healing flow through you, not only will you have this abundant life, not only will you proclaim the word of God, but you won't be able to contain it. You'll be so filled that it will spill over. It would spill over. Very much like that pastor in the beginning of the story. He was so filled with God by by the Holy Spirit that when he was in, a, in line at the airport, there's somebody who wanted, who'd been searching for, and they just had to draw near to it. Here's the last thing here. 
you're if you've if you heard the word of God and you're filled by the Holy Spirit and you're proclaiming it, then you're starting to live out this abundant life, this kingdom life. Here's the promise here is that Jesus has got your back. He'll fight your battles for you. Let's look here in Acts chapter 4 and verse 14 going forward. It says, but since they could see that the man who had been healed standing there with them, right? This is right after they marveled at Peter and John. There was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin. And then they con- uh, conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. These are the leaders, the, uh, the teachers of the law. Uh, these guys are saying this. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, right? It's a miracle. And we cannot deny it. Even they couldn't deny it because 5,000 already came to believe and so much more are probably hearing about this. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eye to say, listen to you or to him? You be the judges, right? Uh, Peter and John, they're putting this on the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. That lame beggar was over 40 years old. He'd been begging there maybe probably for 40 years. So as I said, some have come to see, some have come to do, but some have come to die. Here's evidence of the abundant life. You will face opposition. You will face the evil one in doing kingdom work. When God works, the enemy, he would try to shut it down. He would accuse the healing to be fake. He would try to twist and turn and use the authorities, use those over you and say, that is not the work of God. That is the work of the devil. Or That is not even real. But there's going to be so many people who, who have seen it, who have heard it, and it cannot be contained because the Holy Spirit it spreads like wildfire when he works. I remember there's a time when my wife and I, back in 2015, um, we went home to Wisconsin. We're up in New York. Uh, and it's 2014. And we went up uh, back to Wisconsin. And we're sitting amongst uh, friends and family. And we're talking about the gospel. We're talking about the ministry. And we're talking about what God is doing in our lives. And one of my brothers, my pastoral brothers, he says, he's literally a pastor within our denomination. He says, Hey, so I heard this happened. I know that it was documented um, within the Christian Mission Alliance, but is it true? And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, what, did you, were you there? Because people tell me the story that you were there. And I'm like, dude, just spit it out. What is it? He's like, there's this girl at your school that was healed. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I was there, dude. I saw it. I experienced it. I felt it. He's like, tell me about it. So my first week, after my mom and I, we had our little conflict there. My Three days into being a freshman at Bible college, I saw a girl who from birth had a withered leg, twisted leg, right? Right in front of my eyes. Some of you guys know the story. We prayed for her and her withered leg started to straighten out and it straightened up. And she got up and ran around the chapel like a mad girl. And she's praising God that God had healed her leg. The Christian Missionary Alliance, our denomination, documents it. And they have a video on it. You can go onto the CMA uh, website and look at it and, re- and, and listen to the story. And I was there and I saw it. And I, and I told my buddy this story. And then he says to me, he looks me right in the eye, he says, but was it real? I'm like, dude, it's documented. I was there. I saw it. I felt the Holy Spirit working. He's like, but was it really real? How do you measure that? I was like, in the words of our young people, bra. He could not understand the work of God because he didn't have a framework for it. 
It's documented. There's a video documentary of it. I was there and I saw it. Very much like these men, these judges, these these teachers of the law. This man is standing in their midst. It says, but since, in verse 14, they couldn't see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. That's the kingdom, guys. It's that God, he'll take people who, who don't understand things and he'll twist their understanding because he wants to break the box that they have, their theological framework, and he wants to say, I'm so much bigger than what you think I am. Because the enemy, the enemy doesn't show up in a red suit and a pitchfork, as I said, but he'll show up in your friends. He'll show up in your leaders. He'll show up in your family. He doesn't possess them, but he'll use them to say things against you. He'll use your very spouse, your very children to say things against you. But we all have to discern what this temptation is, what these evil thoughts are. Because the enemy, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy And he'll use the very people who are closest to you. In this season of life, more so than ever, um, back in in February, my wife and I, we were praying. I've been more spiritually attacked in this season of my life than ever in my 30 years of life. And I'll get sleep paralysis. Right? More than ever, and I'll question myself, I'll wake up panting and i say, Lord, is there something I need to confess? Lord, is there a hidden secret sin? And I would give all that to God, and the next night it would happen again. And again, and again, it happened to a point where I, I would sleep with a light on it, and I would tell my wife, be close to me, because if it happens, I'm going to grab you, wake me up. But I'm reminded that I have a Lord Jesus Christ who's given me life and life to the fullest, and that I can pray to him. And in the name of Jesus Christ, the enemy will flee. But I was being attacked this past February, March, and April, more so than ever. I, I, I felt like it was all me. I felt like I was taking on this burden. But little did I know that it, during that time, the enemy was attacking very much our young adults, our youth, our young couples. He's attacking our whole church because... He wants to break things from the inside out. And when he tries to break things from the inside out, we're not going to see it. You're going to start arguing with your wives, men, and you're not going to understand why. Wives, you're going to start to get mad at your husbands, and you're not going to understand why. You've, you're going to have broken relationships, and you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to understand. You're going to be like, well, that's her fault. That's his fault. Young adults, you're going to start to fall away. You're going to, uh, you, you may have already experienced this, that I don't want to lead no more. I don't want to teach no more. I don't want to take up this identity. I don't want to take up this position. But the truth is, none of that is true. That husband and wives should work together. You should have strong relationships. Jalal should be, uh, have strong relationships to young adults. All throughout, all the way to children's ministry. But the devil has been working, even in our very church. So if we are unaware of or not discerning, we have to understand that we have this enemy. We have to understand that we have a bigger God who works for our good. That's part of this abundant life. In John 8, verse eight, uh, verse 31 through 32, it says, To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teachings, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Here's something that the Lord gave me, and I want to share with you guys that the worst thing you can do for the kingdom is not to proclaim it. It's the worst thing you can do. Is if you receive it and you never proclaim it. That's the worst thing you can do. The Bible says if we if we who know what is what is good and we ought we ought to do it, but if we don't do it, that is a sin. And that goodness is this abundant life. This life, the spirit filled life that overflows, that should over. Low. Verse 18 and 20 in Acts 4 here says, Then they called them again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all the name of Jesus. In verse 20, they answered them, As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. About what we have seen and what we have heard. 
I don't know where you guys are at with your walk with Christ today. I don't know if you've actually really received this abundant life or if others have noticed in you. I don't know if you're at the bump, set, and spike yet of life. I don't know if that analogy even rings true to you today. But we have coaches in here. We have pastors in here. We have leaders in here. We have small group leaders. We have co-leaders. We have champions. That's how our church functions. That would love to lead you through this. We would love to help you understand more about this abundant life. Not about this materialistic life, but about this abundant life. I'd like to leave you guys with this. That this abundant life, it starts with transformation from the inside out. With words and deed. Hand in hand. Neither or without the other. With word and deeds. And then like Peter and John, with a proclamation of Jesus and his kingdom. And lastly, we know that we have an enemy. But you and I, we don't have to defend ourselves because God has got our back. Uh, with this, I want to read this verse in John chapter 5, starting verse 24. It says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me, talking about his heavenly father, has eternal life. This eternal life, this abundant life is being used in this kingdom is being used interchangeably. It will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. So if you didn't get any of those three, if you have heard his word and you believe in Jesus Christ, then you have eternal life. You have this abundant life. Ed Stetzer uh, uh One of the senior editors of Christianity Today writes this. He says, Abundant life is not about what we have. It's not about what we get. It's not about what we claim. Ultimately, the abundant life is about what we receive as a gift from the Lord and to live knowing we are stewards of his blessings. So simple. And what he's talking about, what we have and not what we get is not the things of this world, but in that of Christ Jesus himself. So today is not a, it's not a prosperity gospel, but it, it is about a greater prosperity that comes from a gospel-centered life. Amen. I want to invite you guys. If you want to have the abundant life or if you've never received eternal life, right? if you want to have the abundant life, I want you guys to stand with me. If you want to go deeper, if you want to be filled, and you're so tired of living this same life, because it's, yeah, it's Labor Day, right? We're supposed to rest. But if you want to live this abundant life where people are going to notice it and then you're going to proclaim it and you're not going to be afraid of it because God's got your back, stand with me. And if today for the first time you're like, I have no idea what this eternal life is, you can also stand and receive. Because the same Lord who who, who spoke in in the Bible, who, who speaks, I mean, he still speaks today. Yeah. Here's what I want, I want you to do. There's, there might be people around you. There might not be people around you. I just want you to put your hand on someone's shoulder right next to you. Right? We're connected as a family. And I'm going to pray for you. And then when I get done praying for you, I want you to actually look that person in the eye and be like, how can I pray for you to receive the abundant life? Because you have it. So here's how you're going to practice giving it. We're going to start with you being able to pray for that person. And it may be as simple as, man, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. Pray for me, right? Or, man, I got to work while everyone has off for Labor Day. Or, dude, I'm going to have a barbecue later. Come on over. All right, let's pray for the food, right? But this abundant life, it starts right here in this room with a word of prayer. Amen? Let's pray together.